Okay, I think we are going to go ahead and get started here in just a minute. All right, well, thank you for joining us for the Iowa CASA Confidentiality Series. This is part one of a three-part confidentiality series. Um, so we're just taking a deeper dive into this topic um, and we're excited to um, have you all. So you're gonna um, kind of hear more about confidentiality laws, standards, and practices that advocates kind of face in their day-to-day -day work. Oftentimes we discuss the importance of confidentiality, but haven't taken the time to explore this topic since our victim counselor trainings. So this will be a great refresher, as well as provide some new thoughts and ideas around putting this topic into practice. If you just bear with me for one minute, I am going to get our closed captioning on the screen. We're using a new uh, webinar platform, Zoom. Um, so we're still kind of just getting used to it. All right, here we go. So um, my name is Maggie Wozniki. I'm the member services specialist here at Iowa CASA. And so really what that means is that I'm just here to support all the advocates and programs around the uh, state in whatever way um, that looks like for you. So maybe that's finding resources, maybe that's um, setting up some trainings or programs uh, for you. If you have any questions related to your advocacy work, you can email me uh, here at membership at iwacasa.org and I can connect you to the right person here at the coalition or elsewhere in the state. Uh, so really just a resource and a support for you all. And part of my job is to look at member service standards. And so those are kind of the best practices and the laws regarding our work as advocates. And so one of those pieces is confidentiality. Today we're gonna go over a few items. We're gonna identify those legal and those service standards that I just talked about that promote confidentiality. We're gonna articulate the importance of advocate privilege. Um, and so hopefully you'll uh, be able to articulate the importance of this privilege to other professionals that you work with, to the survivors that you work with. We're gonna identify limited exceptions to confidentiality. So when are those times that you can break or you are allowed to break confidentiality. And then we're gonna start just getting comfortable talking about confidentiality concepts with our survivors and other people that we're working with in the field. So why is confidentiality important? One reason is that survivors are more willing to access services. They won't have to fear reporting. They don't have to hear negative reactions from friends, from family, or from their community. You may be the only one person or the only entity that they can completely trust, so they're willing to go to you for services. Speaking of trust, survivors' trust in our services will be reinforced if we promote confidentiality so folks will keep coming back for healing services if they know you are a trusted individual. They will let others know that you can be trusted, um, which is huge because word of mouth is a big reason that we have access to so many survivors that they come here because they've heard of other um, great experiences that other survivors have had. So your ability to maintain confidentiality will have an impact on the perception your whole community has about you and your program. It enhances survivor safety. Your ability to prioritize confidentiality means that you understand how reporting or disclosing information about the survivor could affect their safety. Um, so some examples of this, uh, the person that caused harm um, may retaliate if they find out. So that's one reason why 
Um, it's important to keep confidentiality. Um, information could be used against a survivor in a divorce, custody, child welfare cases, or manipulated by those who have done harm. It could affect a survivor's education, employment, or housing if you disclose information about them. It could affect their health or even re-traumatize the survivor if we break that confidentiality. And it could just affect survivors' relationships with their family, their friends, and the community. So it's really important that you hold anything that a survivor tells you near and dear to your heart. Even if none of these actually happen, this could affect their sense of or their perception of their safety. Confidentiality is also important because it really preserves the dignity of survivors and it empowers survivors. It reinforces principles that survivors control their own personal information. And survivors get to decide if, how, and when their private information is shared. And just kind of to summarize all that, it's really not our information to share. Um, so that's why we have to hold it uh, confidential. So in short, confidentiality is really the pillar of our advocacy work. It is the foundation of the advocate-survivor relationship. Um, so if a survivor can trust you with their information, then they um, can trust you enough to build some sort of relationship with you. And I really like this quote, it's from the Resource Sharing Project. Um, and I think this just really goes to show why it is so important to maintain confidentiality. So it says, it is not easy to share experiences of sexual violence. It requires a lot of courage and trust. It is an honor for advocates to witness survivors breaking the silence of sexual violence. So next we're going to go into confidentiality standards and laws. Um, so first we have our federal laws and our federal funding sources and just a few that come to mind that discuss confidentiality are the Violence Against Women's Act, which is VAWA, the Victims of Crime Act, VOCA, and the Family Violence Prevention and Services Act, FITSA. So all three of these all prohibit sharing or identifying anything about a survivor without their informed, written, reasonably time-limited consent. And we'll talk really about what that statement means in just a bit here. But in order to receive funding from these federal sources, the grant conditions prohibit programs like yours from making the signing of a release a condition of service. And so what that means is that um, any survivor should be able to walk in and receive services without having to release any of their information. Additionally, VAWA, the Violence Against Women's Act regulations require folks to make reasonable efforts to prevent any disclosure of identifying and personal information, especially when making use of any databases, um, whether it's internal or managed by an outside company. Uh, the confidentiality protections set forth in these federal laws and grant conditions apply to any survivor, any survivor who requests services, regardless of whether you provide services or not, any survivor who receives services, or any survivor who has received services in the past, no matter how long ago it has been. The second um, kind of law that we're gonna go into is our Iowa state law, so often referred to as Iowa state code. And that code here in the slide says 915.20a. So you'll often hear us coalition staff refer to this as 915. Um, so this is a really important code for you to kind of keep on hand. Maybe in your web browser you have it bookmarked or you have a copy of it in your go bag. Um, but this is kind of a really important uh, law that has to do with advocates here in our own state. 
And so what Iowa Code 915.20a says is that a victim counselor, otherwise known as an advocate, shall not be examined or required to give evidence in any civil or criminal proceeding as to any confidential communications made by a victim to a counselor. So really this protects you, this gives you privilege um, to keep everything um, between a survivor and yourself confidential. And so it's really important to keep in mind your victim counselor certification, making sure that is up to date, because this code only applies to advocates who are certified. So just keep that in mind. Remember to go through all your advocate trainings, your continuing eds, and keep all that paperwork on, on hand because it is important um, if your counselor, victim counselor status ever comes into question. Our next um, kind of standard or law we'll talk about is our funders standards. And so one of our main funders here in the state of Iowa for our victim service programs is CVAD, the Crime Victim Assistance Division. And so some funders um, such as CVAD have um, eligibility requirements. So they will give your program money as long as you follow certain uh, certified assurances or certain rules. Um, and so one of those is that your programs maintain confidentiality. So a lot of different entities here are telling us that uh, it's important to maintain confidentiality. And then the last one is our own, Iowa CASA's service standards. And so these member service standards kind of encapsulate all of this information I just went through. So it's very um, detailed and it's really the most protective standard in that way. So you can always just refer to the Iowa CASA standard and that really has all of the information about the federal laws, the state code, and so on. So we use these standards just to make sure that programs and yourselves are in compliance with the laws and the best practices in the field of sexual assault work. So we started out by talking about why confidentiality is vital to the services that we provide. This is why all of these policies from various entities have been set in place and why we must adhere to all of them. These are written policies that you can refer back to anytime, whether you are thinking through a challenging situation with a survivor or you're having trouble articulating your mandates to a community partner, such as law enforcement or an attorney, um, or you know anyone else that you work with frequently. And so if you ever have trouble finding any of these um, kind of guidelines, feel free to reach out to me and I can provide you with the writings of them. So there's a lot of um, terms that we can need to fully understand in order to practice confidentiality. There's a lot of jargon involved in the laws around confidentiality, and I know it can be kind of confusing. So we're just going to take a step back and go through some of them. Um, it's also easy, just or really good to uh, know the terminology because it helps us to explain these concepts to the survivors that we work with. We're going to um, go through these, and I just really want you to feel comfortable and knowledgeable when talking about this issue. And so if you have any questions, again, just feel free to reach out. So the concepts you're going to hear a lot when we are talking about confidentiality will be PII, which is personal identifiable information, informed consent, privacy, confidentiality, and privilege. So personally identifiable information, or for short, we say PII. So this means information about an individual that may directly or indirectly identify that individual. So in the case of a survivor of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, it also means information that would disclose the location of that individual. So personally identifiable information includes information like a person's name, address, other contact information, their social security number, their date of birth, um, 
the individual's race or ethnicity, the number of children they have. Um, so even if it's not, um, you know, a name and an address or a way we can get a hold of someone, if in some way um, a combination of information um, can also identify someone. So it kind of has this mosaic effect where the information by itself may not be identifying, but combined with other information, it could identify a person. So again, that could be, you know, we listed a couple, but that could also be like the neighborhood someone lives in, the place they go to school, the hospital that they visited, the police station they visited, even, you know, in some rural areas, the county that they're in, um, the church that they go to. So really thinking about all of the information that we hold about a survivor and really making sure we do not disclose any of it in any conversations we have with family or friends or coworkers even. So just kind of thinking about all of those pieces. So just for an example, uh, you come home to your partner or your roommate and you're exhausted, sad, and angry after a 2 a.m. call at the hospital. They ask you how it went. Telling them any details of the assault would be a breach of confidentiality. However, you could always tell them about how you feel. So if you're sad, angry, exhausted, that is okay to share. Another example, data regarding a 13-year-old African-American female rape victim from a specific neighborhood can be quite identifying, even if her name and exact address are not provided. Okay, so even talking about very broad um, ideas about a survivor could potentially identify them, especially in smaller communities and rural communities. So just keep that in mind. The next concept is informed consent. So what does this really mean? We talk about uh, consent a lot of, in our work. So in terms of confidentiality, informed consent um, means that the survivor must understand the risks, benefits of, and alternatives to sharing their information. So if the survivor asks you to share their information with another entity, another partner, um, they, you're gonna want to have discussions about what that looks like, about, yeah, there might be benefits to that, but here are all the risks involved. Here are some alternative ways we can share that information or get at the same answer or problem. Um, so it's really important to have a thorough conversation with a survivor before ever disclosing information, even if it's at the survivor's request. So uh, informed consent, just kind of review, we talked about alternatives, benefits, and risks. I would also add to that, that you allow a survivor opportunities to ask questions and the option of not proceeding even if they were the original um, person to bring up the idea of disclosing information. So just, again, a lengthy conversation about disclosing information is necessary. And all of this is important because we need to prioritize a survivor's right to self-determination over what we think is best. We need to honor their choice about if and how they share their information. So, what does a conversation about informed consent look like in your advocacy practice? Have you practiced this conversation? Have you perfected it? So don't be afraid of discussing this topic too much with the survivor. It will only um, benefit the survivor and also, again, reinforce that trust the survivor may have with you. And then the last kind of terms we're going to go through today are privacy, confidentiality, and privilege. And these are often thought of as interchangeable terms, um, but they're actually quite different. So we're going to go through what they mean. So privacy just means that it's 
someone's private information, right? So it means that it's a survivor's right to make decisions about it, if they share information, how much they share. So when a, a survivor comes to you or anyone else, they, have, they hold a certain amount of knowledge or information about their experience, and that's called their private information. So that's what privacy means. It's the survivors. Confidentiality is more about the legal or ethical duty to protect someone else's information. So again, we're operating as advocates under confidentiality, that it's our duty to hold that person's private information uh, to ourselves. We're keeping it confidential. And then privilege is that legal protection um, that is in the Iowa Code 915.20a. And so that's um, really a protection that we have, which is awesome, that says that at, in court we can't disclose um, information, that it's, it's um, protected. So just kind of a fact you may not know about privilege is even if a survivor takes action to make information public or have an advocate certify they're receiving services, a court may rule that they have waived privilege or that they're opening the door to us explaining or detailing even more information. So we really have to be careful and have these conversations with survivors. Um, that they do not um, kind of discuss what you talked about, just the two of you, um, with any other third party. So who owns the privilege? The survivor owns, or the survivor holds the privilege, not the advocate. It is theirs. Because they own it, they get to decide what to do with it. It is their right to waive it or give it up. So again, have conversations about the risks involved with that, but it is ultimately the survivor's decision. And it's our job to honor that, right? The privilege does not belong to the advocate. The advocate does not have the power to decide that a survivor should share information. The advocate should not advise the survivor to share information. It's just not our role. And even though the privilege belongs to the survivor, it is our responsibility to protect it. If the survivor gives no instructions at all, the advocate must assume the survivor would not want the information disclosed and must refuse to disclose it. So if nothing else, always come back to these two questions and answers. It is not our information to share. It is our job to vigorously protect the information. Now this is a question we get a lot. Um, when is it okay to break confidentiality? So this is um, per the Violence Against Women's Act. We can break confidentiality only in a few circumstances. If the survivor is at imminent danger or imminent risk, um, or if there's imminent danger or risk uh, to others, if the survivor has requested that we break confidentiality, or if some uh, state or federal statute or court compels the release of information. So those are the three things that that was this. So breaking confidentiality due to imminent danger. First, what is an imminent danger? Oops. Sorry there. All right, so imminent danger, according to, um, I pulled a definition from IDA, IDHS, um, and they see it as immediate threat, or, um, you know, also, knows an, also known as imminent danger, which means conditions which, if no response were made, would be more likely than not to result in abuse, injury, or death, okay? So an example, an adult survivor of child sexual abuse that you've been working with in support groups stops by the office. You notice that she is slurring her speech. She tells you that she just wants to 
it all to end and that she took a bunch of sleeping pills a little while ago. What do you tell her about your responsibilities to alert authorities? Okay, so to me, this sounds like it actually would be uh, an immediate threat or uh, risk of injury or death to the survivor, so you would have to alert authorities, maybe call an ambulance. But what do you have to tell the emergency responders? You're always going to want to tell them minimal amount of information, so you do not have to give the survivor's name to them. You do not have to say that you know the survivor or how you know the survivor. So really, um, you know, kind of think through all of those pieces if you are going to break that confidentiality. If you are thinking of reporting, um, just want to go through a few of our kind of thoughts on this as a coalition. So IWACASA and our member program advocates are not required to report cases to the authority. We are called permissive reporters. We are not manda mandatory reporters, as outlined in IWA code 232.69, okay? So we are not included in the list of mandated reporters. So we, according to VAWA, we do not uh, ever report. Um, and so just keep this in mind. And then of course that exception is the immediate risk factor that we just talked about. All right, and so um, really think through all the ramifications for the survivor and their family if the authorities were called. As advocates, it's not our role to investigate abuse. It's our role to support, to believe, to validate, to provide options and resources to survivors. So if you're thinking of reporting, what are some of those unintended consequence, consequences for reporting someone you are working with? What are the survivor's thoughts or feelings regarding a report? Have you asked them? What will the impact on a minor be involved in this event? Will their life be improved by reporting? And just keep in mind that information spreads. So even if you hold the information confidential other than making the report, those that you report to may not have to. It might be part of a permanent record. Um, DHS provides copies of reports to abuse to police and county attorney who inv investigate abuse with other subjects and those stay in the record for a few years and are available. Um, so just remember that information spreads. And once you give away information, you have no control over it, right? So just kind of a reminder, at times the anti-violence movement has prioritized safety. So we think we have to protect or keep a survivor safe over their self-determination. So building, we have built many services based on the idea that if we make a survivor safe, then they can start to increase their self-determination. When in our experience, the opposite is true. We need to, instead of a product of safety, build self-determination to create sustainable, authentic safety in one's life. So then we have this question often of, what if I am a mandatory reporter because I have a, a social work license or I have an educator's license? or some other type of licensed professional that works within the agency. So if you are hired as a licensed individual to provide services that are needed by a licensed individual, so for instance, if you're hired as a therapist to provide therapy, then you follow your manda mandated reporting rules. If you are a therapist, a licensed therapist, but you're hired as an advocate, you do not uh, report. You are a permissive reporter. So really making sure, you know, there are a few agencies here in Iowa that do hire therapists on staff. So really making sure that the survivors that you're working with know the difference in reporting rules between advocates and therapists is really important.
And if you ever want to kind of look more into this, um, you know, there's Iowa code 232.69, and I can provide you with a copy of that, that says any of the following persons who in the scope of professional practice or in their employment res responsibilities examines, attends, counselors, or treats a child and reasonably believes a child has suffered abuse, then they're a mandated reporter. And so advocates are just not listed in that. Um, we're not included. So, you know, it's, again, our job to vigorously protect a survivor's information and really not exercise that permissive reporting unless we really need to. And then federal laws actually tell us, again, only if you have to make a report under those a few circumstances that you must make reasonable attempts to provide notice of the release to affected victims and you must take steps necessary to protect the privacy and safety of persons affected by their release. So this is per VAWA and BOCA. So really consider being survivor centered in your approach to reporting if you need to. Um, if it's safe to do so, discuss with the survivor if they want to make the call, um, if they want to make it with you, or if they want to be present for you making the call. So really discuss uh, the options there. So the other way um, we may uh, breach confidentiality is if the survivor requests us to. So oftentimes um, this comes like if a survivor wants to um, check on police case, um, maybe they want verification that they've received services for something. So they have a very specific request that they're asking of you and they need you to release that information. So a release of information is always needed um, if a survivor asks you to release any information. So your agency should have this form. It should be updated fairly regularly, I would say annually, um, and it should contain very specific details. You're gonna wanna go over these details with the survivor you're working with so that they fully understand the form that you have them sign. So the forms need to be written. Um, they need to be informed, as we talked about, informed consent. They need to be very specific and they need to be reasonably time limited. Um, so what I mean by that is however much time it takes for you to get the information to that third party. And so a reasonably time limited uh, release of information really could be something like seven to 14 days. Um, oftentimes people put a standard one year, um, which is just not acceptable. We don't need to be sharing information back and forth with an agency um, for that long. Uh, so really talk to the survivor about how long it reasonably will take you to get that information across, and then that will be your expiration date for the release. And if you ever need extra time, then you can go, um, you can have an addendum on the release of information and have them reaffirm with the new uh, end date. So you're always going to want to consider the most protective option uh, for a survivor and um, filling in the minimally necessary information. So what that means is really um, in the release of information, put exactly what you're going to share with that third party. And so make it specific as possible. If, um, let's say it's a verification uh, that the survivor is receiving services, write exactly that. Um, if it's to connect with the police department because the survivor really doesn't want to uh, deal with talking to the police anymore or keep checking up on the case, then you need to write exactly what you are allowed to per the survivor's request discuss with the police department. So it's just checking on the status of a case, then you need to write that in. So releases are really never used for the ease of your, yourself, or your programs, or anyone else's um, 
ease. It's really only used for the ease of the survivor because that's what they wanted. Releases can be withdrawn in writing or verbally. Um, it's okay to have them withdrawn verbally because there's no harm in not sharing information, right? So it needs to be written if you do share information, but it can be withdrawn verbally. Uh, releases should never be required to receive services. And again, because they're specific, you're going to want to write separate releases for separate, separate items. So never general pre-filled out waivers. Um, and they should be specific about the person you're contacting. So have the person within the agency you're contacting, have that person's name, have that person's um, division or role, their office phone number. Um, so don't make it, you know, let's say it's the Des Moines Police Department. You shouldn't be writing in Des Moines Police Department because you shouldn't be sharing information with every single Des Moines police officer, right? So you're gonna write the name of the person within the agency that you're working with. So again, we're gonna to wanna to talk about alternatives for survivors. Um, what are some other ways, because once we share information, as we talked about, you'll never get that information back. You have no control over how it's being shared or used. And so really talk about some other ways to share information. Um, So let's say um, you could have a three-way call um, with a survivor and that third party so that you're on the phone supporting the survivor, but that they're ultimately giving the authorization to discuss the, the topic. Um, you could practice conversations with the survivor um, so that they feel empowered to ask um, or release their own information themselves. Or you can ask agencies general questions without really releasing any of the survivor's personal identifiable information. So what are the risks to survivors uh, of releasing information? I think we went over this um, a lot that you just don't have control over what's being shared and you don't have control over what remains confidential or what stays in permanent records. So who should sign a release for a minor child? Um, so, and then the other question is who should sign a release for a dependent adult? So VAWA 2013 and VOCA both clarified that a minor or a person with a legally appointed guardian who is permitted by law to receive services without the parent or guardian's consent, consent may also release their own information without the consent of their parent or guardian. And so if someone is able to reasonably walk in to your office or call you on the hotline and ask for services, then they are also in charge of their own information and whether it's released or not. In the case of a dependent adult, and if the uh, guardian is, um, if the guardian is saying, you know, they want the information shared um, with you know, a third party, then you're really gonna wanna make sure and clarify that, that they are the guardian. So you're gonna wanna see official uh, guardian paperwork. And there are many types of guardians out there. And so we really wanna make sure that they do ultimately have that um, authority to make decisions or not. And so feel free to show the official guardian documents to either the coalition or an attorney that you um, use with your agency, but really make sure that that is in place. Um, if it's just, you know, a parent or a caregiver, um, then again, that person does not have the authority to make those decisions. And our final topic we're going to be discussing is how do we communicate confidentiality and the, port and the importance of it with survivors, with the community of partners that we work with, and even with our coworkers? So when we're talking about working with survivors, address confidentiality as soon as possible. So when you first meet a survivor or talk to them on the phone, just, you know, I want you to know that everything you tell me is confidential. 
I am bound by the law not to share anything without your expressed approval unless I believe you or someone else is at risk of serious danger. Um, they have the right to know upfront what type of relationship you have with them. Um, and it's just important because of, again, trust. Um, and so you're going to want to talk about it as soon as possible, but I know there are a lot of details that you'll want to go into. And so when they're appropriate and as they arise, always make sure to take time out to explain things um, in a way that a survivor understands what you're talking about. And also just thinking about trauma and how it affects our brain. Um, talking about confidentiality often is a good idea, right? So just because you had one conversation in the first five minutes of meeting a survivor doesn't mean that they're gonna retain or remember everything. And so it's okay to just kind of briefly mention confidentiality on a regular basis and ask the survivor clarifying questions um, or if they, you know, have any thoughts or anxiety around the issue. We're also going to want to talk about these confidentiality issues with survivors. So we're going to want them know, want to let them know what rights they have, what our agency policies are, um, circumstances where you may need to break confidentiality, you know, individual uh, confidentiality versus support group settings. So what does confidentiality look like then? Um, how do we keep and maintain their records? Do they have the right to anonymity? And so really thinking through, you know, letting survivors know up front, hey, you don't have to share your name with me if you don't want to. Um, how would you like me to refer to you? Um, talking to survivors about grievance policies. So if you, for some reason, um, break their confidentiality, do they have a right to complain to the agency and how do they do that? Another thing you might want to talk about is if you see each other in public, what will happen? If you meet each other in public spaces, people may see you together and know that you're receiving services. So what does that look like? And then perception also matters. So even if you are maintaining confidentiality, in some instances, it may not look like it. And so you're gonna want to do your best to avoid those circumstances. So let's say a teenage survivor and her mother both wish to receive services. You're gonna want to have different advocates serving each of them. So it doesn't feel like, you know, you might be sharing information between the teenager and the mother. If you're friends with the police officer working on the survivor's sexual assault case, then maybe um, don't use the time that you're in their office or they're in yours to have, you know, friendly relationships. Um, really wait until the survivor is gone to have uh, conversations that have nothing, have nothing to do with the survivor, right? I'm thinking about how do we talk about survi survivors with our community partners. So thinking through these questions as an agency, what should we tell them about our responsibility to survivors? How can we collaborate without breaching confidentiality? And will this impact our relationship with our partners if they don't agree with our confidentiality practices? So do you ever feel pressured to share information? Um, really thinking through these questions will help you have those kind of honest and open conversations with your community partners. It's also really important to discuss the differences in confidentiality protections among community services with survivors so they can make informed decisions. So especially around those um, that are subject to mandatory reporting. So maybe um, you refer them to another agency for um, food supplies or for child care or something like that, they may not have the same reporting responsibilities as you, so making sure that survivors don't have that assumption going into uh, services that you referred them to.
And oftentimes we think because our agencies are confidential that we can discuss anything openly with our coworkers about uh, survivors that we're working with. But really we want to, I'm sorry, we really want to limit that. Um, so yes, this is a, a challenge. We want to debrief with our coworkers because this work is so hard. Um, and sometimes we're just burnt out, frankly, and want to kind of unload to our coworkers. But we really need to remember to stick to our feelings, um, stick to information about asking questions or gathering uh, resources and really avoid the details of a survivor's case. So really thinking through how much information is too much. What can I get by telling my coworker without revealing um, too much information about the survivor I'm working with? I mean, honestly, like a, a, another advocate never needs to know the name or any PII, personally identifiable information about the survivors you work with to be able to debrief or assist you. Really recognize the symptoms of that burnout, the compassion fatigue, um, because oftentimes we're oversharing information about a survivor when symptoms of compassion fatigue are high. And really be mindful of where you're at with your coworkers when you're discussing information. So never discuss information in public spaces with third party present um, when you're off work hours. I mean, really being careful if any, any mandatory reporters are, are around. So come to mutual agreements with your coworkers about what this looks like and really try to hold each other accountable. It's in the best interest for survivors. And that wraps up our confidentiality primer. Um, just in closing, we really wanna talk about how Iowa CASA can be there uh, for support for you all. And so we're here to talk through any complex cases you have. Again, I talked about a lot of um, code references, a lot of legal references. And so a co as a coalition, we can provide you with those resources if you're having trouble finding them. We can review your confidentiality forms and your agency policies and practices around confidentiality and provide you with feedback. Um, and then if you ever need a refresher training or just a more in-depth conversation with your staff, we can conduct those. So again, feel free to reach out. Our other two webinars um, that will be online and available are confidentiality and technology, which is part two and confidentiality in smaller communities, which is part three. Thank you all for attending, and we look forward to hearing from you.